I'm Rochelle Courtney, and I'm super excited to bring you another bloody podcast. Welcome back to another episode. I would like today to introduce Kim, who's received an It's in the Bag donation from Share the Dignity during an incredibly difficult time of her life. Kim had been experiencing domestic violence and her and her daughter had to suddenly leave their home with nothing but the clothes on their back. They were placed in a safe house where they were given an It's in the Bag donation, providing them with the essentials that they needed to be able to get clean and wash the day away after such a traumatic experience. Welcome, Kim. Thank you for having me. I'm going to start with the first question. Would you rather buy yourself pads or buy your daughter pads? My daughter. Has this happened to you before? I have instant goosebumps. Yes. It has for long periods of time. And uh, I find it actually really difficult right now that I actually have come a really long way and I still actually feel a little bit of shame about that. Um, wow. Yeah, wow. Um, but your children always come first, right? Um, especially when you're a struggling mother. Wow, you got me. Um, yeah, because I would never want um, either of my children to feel the shame that I went through as a as a young woman. And um, I don't think people actually understand the impact of the word shame, and especially when it's uh, got to do with a period um, and uh, wow you so got me can I get somebody to get oh. some tissues the first time I met you I was instantly drawn to you we were like magnets but I remember questioning myself why was this beautiful woman with these great big boobs <laughs> What was that all about? And I'm really embarrassed to say, and I, the one thing that I hate the most about a personality is judgment, right? Because we all have a backstory and I hated myself for judging you on, on that. And when you told me the why you had, had big boob implants put in, yeah. um, I, to this day, still tear up. Are you happy to share? what that story Absol was? Yeah, absolutely. I am a survivor of uh, child sexual abuse. My perpetrator was a family member and he had actually sexually abused um, 14 of our family members, only girls. And uh, so I was sexually abused from the age of three until the day I ran away from home at 15. And I... As soon as I could, I saved up the money. It took me seven years. I saved up the money to have a breast augmentation because I didn't want to be a little girl anymore. So mentally I had them done because I didn't want to be a little girl and I didn't want to keep revisiting being sexually molested. Um, and you're absolutely right. A lot of people don't really understand, like, there's a whole heap of reasons we get them done, but mine wasn't on a vanity level. Mine was, I don't want to be a little girl anymore. And every time I looked at myself, I was a little girl. I was back flat, 10-year-old boy with a nipple. And um, I, I, ne I needed to change that um, because it had a huge impact on my daily life. I am sorry that you went through that, but I'm also sorry that I judged you, but I also sit in the place where now I could hope and wish for everybody else to remember that what somebody does with their body or <laughs> what they say or do has got nothing to do with you unless it's not harming you. So yeah. it's, do you know what I mean? So Absolutely. it was a big eye-opening moment for me, still hearing it now, I it, it hurts my heart and it, you know, it hurts to hear it. So I can't imagine how much it hurts to be that person and have lived it as well. Yeah. There was multiple cousins that he was doing this to and the generation before me he was doing this to as well. Uh, I 
run away from home at 15 uh, due to not a very nice environment at home. My mother and father broke up when I was eight. Uh, we moved from the Gold Coast to Brisbane and um, I grew up in Housing Commission after that. So we had a not a privileged life, but we had a very comfortable life um, that my dad provided very well, but he didn't provide, that's all he provided. Mm. Moved to Brisbane when I was around eight years of age, uh, played netball, was fantastic at netball, if I just say so myself. Um, you know, did zone, got into zones from school, got into, you know, metropolitan. So, you know, by the time you're playing club and you're playing zone and you're playing, you know, those levels, netball was my favourite thing. Um, all of my counsellors throughout the years have always said, you know, what are, you, what are your greatest childhood memories? I'm like playing netball because I was safe. That was where I felt valued and loved, safe, and I could achieve. Um, and also school was the safest place in my life as a child because no one could touch me there. Mm. So, yeah, so that's a bit of my, a bit of my background um, moving forward. And then, yeah, I've stayed in Brisbane and uh, ended up in, you know, a couple of domestic violence relationships um, and learning now that, you know, um, being abused as a small child, that there are no boundaries, you know, like I, I wasn't taught any boundaries and I need to do as I'm told and not, you know, keep everyone happy and shut up and, it still gets me, you know, it still gets me. During your life between 15 and 23, what did that involve for you? Did you, so seven, how, where did you move to when you were 15? So, so 15, I ran away from home. I actually ran away to a very old family friend's place. So I uh, took a taxi to um, my auntie Lillian's and got there and she was like, okay, you're safe, you're safe. I was like, okay, cool. Did she so, know that? About the she didn't know about the sexual stuff, but she knew how violent my mum was. My mum was my mum was an alcoholic, but a very violent alcoholic. So she was very abusive. The things that my brother and myself went through, uh, she probably should have been in jail for. She was, um, you know, her and her and my father fought like two men. Um, I can remember my little brother only being two or three, and my and him, him not eating, eating his dinner. Now, when I tell people this, I go, he was in a high chair. So a high chair is young. It is so young. And I can remember my brother didn't want to eat his vegetables and my father kicked the high chair and the high chair smashed and he split the top of his mouth through his gums and... It was like, oh, that's, that's okay. We just all need to be quiet. You know, like the violence was unspeakable. And that's for me, um, you know, my first relationship at 17, it was a little bit dodgy, but it wasn't as bad as the violence that I experienced as a young girl. And like your witnessed. bar was set so low, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and other families knew how violent she was, but they were petrified of her. There were times we would have an auntie visit and we would say we would beg her, please take us with you, please take us with you. And she was like, no, 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 I can't. Like your mum is crazy. Like there is no way I could take you. Let down by them, absolutely, you know, because I, I feel like the older generation let us down. The consequences of being sexually abused played out when I had my own child. I um, was going to see a a nurse, you know, just about how where she's developing and stuff like that. And the lady said to me, how often are you bathing her? I was like, oh, uh, maybe nine or ten times a day. She went, pardon? What do you mean? I know, bathing. And I said, yeah, nine or ten times a day. She said, why, why are you bathing her that much? And I said, oh, I can't touch her. She said, what do you mean? I said, I can't touch her private parts. She said, what, what do you, I don't really understand what you're saying. And I said, well, I, I don't, I don't want to hurt her. She said, you're not hurting her, you're cleaning her. I was like, I can't, I can't touch her. And she was like, why? And I said, I can't do it. So every time she had a wet nappy or she pooed herself, I have to put her in the shower and shower her off. And she goes, no, 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 you've got to clean her. And then, but I was like, I can't do it. I don't want to hurt her. And then she was like, okay, we need to talk about this. 
So we talked about it briefly. She, I toilet trained her around two. Um, I struggled to breastfeed her. It was something that I, I never wanted to be invasive to her. I never wanted to. So, and I actually feel even a little bit sick about it now that I couldn't actually clean her or touch her because I never wanted her to feel what I felt. Violated. Yeah. Um, and then at three I started to get counselling about that and then the counsellor gave me the courage to confront my mother and she said, you need to tell her, you need to tell her. And I went, okay, cool, she's going to hit the roof because I was still scared of my mother. At 23 years of age I was still petrified of her. Um, so I told her. Um, it was Christmas Eve. I, vividly, I, I remember the day the time it was, where I was, when the conversation happened. She called and she said, I want to have Courtney for the night. And I said, no, you're not having her. And she said, why? And I said, I've already told you, you're not having her overnight. You failed to protect us. She goes, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, your father molested me from the time I was three to the time I ran away from home. I had anorexia at 17 because I didn't want to be here anymore. I was so ashamed and disgusted and it was so painful to live. It doesn't leave you. It does not leave you and it changes you. It changes who you choose in a partner. It changes you, what you do for people. It changes you in every way. So she called my uncle who I was quite close to and he called me and he called and he said, what's this rubbish I hear that, you know, you're not going to let your daughter stay with your mother? Like that's just normal grandparental things. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm not. And he's like, well, why? I said, she didn't tell you? He goes, No. I said, well, let me tell you because it's, it's your dad. And I said, your father molested me from the age of three into 15. That's the reason I won't run away from home as well as the violence, as well as all of the other stuff. And there was this silence and he said, what do you mean? I said, your father sexually molested me from the age of 15 until when I freed myself at 15. He said, I've got to go. He hung up. And he then went and called a whole heap of cousins that were like 10 years older than me. Within about four hours, he called me back and he said, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. He said, I don't know what to say apart from I'm so sorry. And then all of a sudden there were no Christmas get-togethers. There were no family get-togethers. I say this because I actually really do mean this. Is like I was a whistleblower and I broke the family up. So we we don't talk. Uh was the was the grand your grandfather still alive? No, when? he'd passed away the year before. Yeah. He passed away the year before and I was shamed against because I didn't go to the funeral. But I think the biggest kick in the guts for me, um, from woman to woman, is, you know, aunties that were twenty years my senior went, Yeah. Yeah, he molested me too. I was like, what? What do you mean? And they were like, yeah, well, you know, it was like, yeah, he molested all of us. It was like, why the fuck would you not want to stop? Why would you not want to save the next generation? Do you know, Some, like somebody me as a mum. Somebody else spoken up and yeah. saved you. And do you fuck see you. any of that family at all now? No, I don't. You have a big gap between your, your daughters, yeah? Um, can you tell me about that? I can. That's a great <laughs> question. Uh, a big gap because uh, my eldest was the product of a domestic violence relationship. Uh, planned, always wanted to have her, um, madly deeply in love with her father. I was living on the Gold Coast doing an apprenticeship as a chef and working at Dreamworld at the same time, two jobs. Left home, 15, uh, got myself a really good job, working at a clothes store and then I applied for a job, was working with RACQ and uh, I fell into anorexia really badly, heavily. So I was um, sanctioned. So the police and um, my doctor come to my workplace and put me into hospital because um, I was not in a very good way. And uh, my psychiatrist at the time at the PA hospital said to me, the only way you're going to get out of here is if you get out of Brisbane and get away from your family. 
if you don't, you are going to be six foot under within six weeks. So under his advice, I was very fortunate that the company I worked for, RACQ, put in, I put in for a transfer to the Gold Coast. I moved to the Gold Coast, uh, rented a room out down there, met a, a friend of my brother's, which not a good move, and fell in love with him. And we dated for a while and I always wanted to have children. Did a pregnancy test. I'm pregnant. And um, within about three months, um, he was partying, going out, drinking, drugging, doing all of those things. Then obviously um, being very violent, horrible. So I picked up sticks and drove to Sydney and went to a women's shelter down there. I had my daughter, my, my eldest, um, on my own. The midwife at the time was like, is there anybody you can call? Like, is surely, is there anybody you can call? Because I was like five days late. I was like, I don't have anyone. Like, I don't have anyone. Um, and it was really sad for her. But for me, it was, I don't have anyone, but that's better than having the shit show that I've already been dealt with. So um, had her. And then, Did you feel like you were never alone once you'd had Courtney? Because you would have felt very alone before that. Courtney Marie taught me how to love. She taught me how to love. She showed me love. She gave me love. I didn't know what love was before. You know, they're born and you look into their little beautiful eyes and you're like, how can you hurt this? So for me it was like, wow. Wow. You know, all, all the circumstances were all just a big shit show. And then she arrives and she's amazing. She's late. She's still late. <laughs> she's always late. But she taught me how to love. She gave me love. She was definitely a gift. And the reason for the gap is because uh, I could do one on my own, looking after her and I had a good job and as long as I didn't go near men, life was fine. But you did go near men I again? Did. I did. <laughs> and then... Uh, yeah, that ended up being um, some, something even worse. I unfortunately ended up um, with someone who was involved um, in outlaw motorcycles, gangs. I was only in a relationship for a short time before I said, before I worked out how involved and what was involved um, that it didn't mix with women and children and I didn't get a choice. You don't get to leave. You stay here. So uh, unfortunately my elders and I experienced some, you know, pretty, pretty full on, but I'd actually learnt to shut my mouth and I learnt to um, stay quiet and talk you know, like, well, you know, like leaving the house, I had to, you know, I was timed and where we were going, who we were going with, all of that. It was, it was, it was really hectic. Um, and by this stage, um, I had been forced to have sex when I didn't want to, um, just shut up, just lie down and shut up. So then I fell pregnant. He had a motorbike accident at air and was airlifted and was on life support. And that was a weekend I was leaving. And the police had called and said he'd been in a serious motor vehicle, like motorcycle accident. And I was like, what do I do? And the conditioned me that, you know, just went, okay, I've got to go. The nurture, you know, that nurture. So uh, I went, I went, I flew to Townsville and I, my auntie met me there. And she, the first words were, hers, what the fuck are you doing here? Go home and get out. I mean, I can't. I can't. I just can't do it. I can't leave him. Like, you know, I stayed up there for six weeks, come home, had Olivia. And then, yeah, spent another. Uh, it's really interesting because um, I kicked their dad, her dad out when she was eight and I was eight when my dad left me. Um, and I used to say to people he left until a very good friend of mine said, why do you keep telling people he left? You kicked him out. And I was like. Yeah, actually I did. I kicked him out. And it was like, yeah. So I was cool. Worked, you know, had a restaurant, 
you know, the girls grew up in hospitality. My eldest was doing extremely well. Olivia's doing really, really well. It was really, really nice. And then, oh, on turns up. You were like a magnet. Yeah. To men who treated you with disrespect. Yeah. Because that's what I believe yeah. I deserved. That's That was my worth. That was my worth. I had no boundaries. You then spent quite a while on your own until you... The last and final instalment of your domestic violence yes. in your life, yes. I would hope, yeah? So, unfortunately, I, the last one, which was probably the most soul-destroying, I would never, ever, ever have imagined in my entire life that at 45 I would have been in such a horrific, like, I've done this dress rehearsal three or four times. You're not going to get me again. Wow. Yeah, so it started with this, you know, someone contacted me from the past who knew me through a friend of a friend. I was doing really well, selling real estate, loving life. The girls were great. You know, things were just fine. I'm, I'm cool. Uh, catch up for lunch. And he says, he starts off with, let us be vulnerable together on our first meeting. He told me on the second date that he'd actually manifested me, that I was the one, that of everyone that he's been through and everyone, every previous relationship, all of them were crazy. Oh, Kim, why didn't you see that flag? You made them crazy. Never met anybody like me ever before. I'm so good. You are so gorgeous. Oh, my oh, you God. Are. He wasn't wrong there. And he just said all the right things. He had a really shit childhood. His mother actually murdered his father and did eight years of prison. Apparently his dad used to beat his mum, but he wasn't there. He was given up when he was three. So he didn't live with his mum and his dad. They only reconnected when he was 21, 22. So um, he was raised in foster care and he was abused. So he had this vulnerability connection. And that's the same with the previous relationship. The man that DV'd, he was actually sexually abused when he was a child. So it's we like had trauma is magnetized exactly, to each other, right? Exactly. And so it's like we have this thing in common that was so bad that we can fix each other. Uh, and the same with the with the first, second, third. They were all betrayed by their mothers. What made this domestic violence situation worse than your others? He was stronger and smarter and older. And he moved quick, like real quick. Uh, and to the point where I, I actually questioned my craziness. Can you give me a little bit of detail on how you ended up back into another domestic violence shelter? Late 2019, we had a very traumatic event happen at our house and I'd actually said to him, I need to be, I, I need to be, I think I need to be on my own because, like, I'm going to go through a bit of hell at the moment. And he was like, no, 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 I'm going to be here to protect you. I'm going to be here to protect you. I need to be here to keep you safe. So within three or four months, um, he had put in cameras around the house, he was tracking me, um, I wasn't allowed to pick up my daughter or drop her off so we set up an Uber account for her. She was, she was scared of him. Um, the violence was hor horrific. I had one girlfriend that I could talk to about it in depth and she said, line your ducks up, just line your ducks up, babe. I was told that if I left or I kicked him out or I told anybody, he told me how he was going to kill me and his history was in security so, and he had firearms. So he was very specific how he was going to do that. Tell us about the time he took you out to the forest. He said, oh, I'm, we're going for lunch. I was like, I don't want to go for lunch. And so 30 minutes later and I kept saying to him, where are we going? And he goes, we're going for lunch. And I said, there's, no, there's nowhere to eat around here. I said, you have to take me home. And he said, no, we're going for lunch. And all I could think of was I have a young daughter who at the time was only 15, 16, who needed a mum because she was going through her own struggles at the time. 
So I knew that it was really paramount how I behaved. And I begged. I said, I know you're not taking me for lunch. We are now, we are not even mobile service area anymore. And I could see we were heading towards the Diagla Forest and, you know, I'd been there maybe 10 or 15 years ago and I know there's nothing there. And, um, you know, I, pray, I, 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 do, I have prayed throughout my life, but it was probably one of the days that I pr prayed the most and asked, not today, not today, not today. You know, my eldest is in London. My youngest is at home expecting me to come home. And I'm all she's got. And I don't want to go today. I don't want to go today. So we pulled up at this um, really remote lookout. And he goes, come on, we'll get out and we'll go for a walk. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is it. This is it. Because he used to carry a firearm with him the whole time. He brought a firearm to the house. Um... I had no mobile service, so I couldn't ring anyone. So anyway, we went for a walk. And we went for a walk around the lookout and then some people arrived and I walked back and I sat down. And he said, uh, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I just want to sit for a while. And so, you know, I'm terrified, absolutely terrified. Um, so I said, I want to go home. He goes, get in the car. So I got in the car. And so I picked up my phone and I said, I'm going to, I'm, I just want to let you know I'm recording this. He said, what do you, what do you mean? And I said, I'm recording this. Like I, I kept that phone recording and it recorded some horrific stuff, you know, some screaming and me in fetal position, just, you know, running through the, running through the forest, trying to get away from him, the car revving, the, all of that. I mean, um, I don't think I've listened to it since the court case, but, um, it saved me on that day and um, I managed to get home six hours later. You know, when, when you're looking down death and you don't want to, like you've got children at home and I'm all the God. And so that was when the pol when you told the police what was happening and they literally took you from your home and to somewhere safe, yeah? I reported it and uh, I had eight uniformed police officers, two detectives, two vulnerable persons unit attend my house and when, and my poor daughter, absolute poor daughter, I said, you have to leave now. Like we're, you, you were, you're leaving now. We're organising your safe house. And the next day is when you received your bag, right? The bag, right. Yeah. To receive your bag at, you know, in my late forties, it just gave me it just gave me something in that that um reassured me that that I'm going to be okay that you know your bag's not a small gift it's it's more it's it's more than a gift it is encouragement you all of a sudden feel like someone heard you you all of feel like you all of a sudden feel like someone cares you all of a sudden feel like I'm sorry no, I shouldn't be saying sorry. You know, don't never have <laughs> I'm to be not saying sorry. sorry. To me. Um, it's just not. It's just not about. It's just not about the sanitary items. You know, the favorite thing in the bag. Uh, oh, God, I still got goosebumps. It gets me every time. Is um, women who have been through domestic violence. You you cry a lot. You sweat a lot. You are frightened. You are petrified of your life. You don't get in the shower. You're not safe in the shower. You can't be not on your guard for a minute. So one of the most amazing things was is that I had a bottle of shampoo and conditioner. I didn't have very much. I've got, the, I've got like mouse hair, you know, it's not like I've got these big long locks, but I got to get in, have a shower and wash the whole day away. And I had this like silky, soft, fairy floss hair, which felt really beautiful. But the smell, like, you know, smells are really important. I, you know, we always go when you mow the lawn in summer, it reminds you of summer, you know, the grass. Um, you know, uh, summer storms and stuff like that. So I unfortunately, uh, much to my hairdresser's disliking, I still use that shampoo and conditioner that I can get from Dollars and Cents. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I love it because it was the first day of the rest of my life. 
it empowered me to go, you know what? I've got me, I've got my daughters and there is a whole tribe. I don't know who they are. I don't know where they are, but they've got me. So your bag was this time the most powerful act of kindness that I had ever experienced from head to toe. Mind blowing. I know we say, you know, period products are expensive and yes, they are. And we calculate all, you know, we budget as women, you know, for particular things. And I think I've said this before is the period product aisle is the seventh or the eighth aisle down. It's not your first aisle. So you get all the things that you think you need and then you get to the seventh or the eighth aisle and you've already added up what your budget is for the week. And then it's no, 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 that has to go back out. That has to go back out. That has to go back out. So. Wow. That, um, I mean, there's certainly been times in my life where I've had to pull the five cent pieces out and 10 cent pieces out to buy bread, but I don't know that I've, for me, it's ever been that bad that I've had to count up what I need to spend in the shops. I kind of get to the end and unload my groceries and guesstimate what it will be, right? So yeah, I've never thought of it like that. Yeah. That bag made me worthy. You made me feel worthy. You made me feel that if it's not good, don't do it. I was going to be okay, even if I was on my own, because I had that bag. And that's the power of a bag, right? I've got to say, this woman has taken away all the shame that I had for nearly 50 years. She has, she has given me a voice that I am so proud to use. Sometimes it shudders, but I didn't have a voice 45 years ago. I would have just shut up. That was all five years ago. I've been in the most loving, adorable relationship for the last two years with the most amazing man. Because that's what you deserve. Yeah, it's just because I've learnt boundaries and what's not right and what's not okay and what I'm worth. And that bag gave me my first step. Can you give me a time where you haven't had access to period products? Because I think one of your stories that you share is really profound. Yeah, that that would be um, when I was doing a tea and tidy job. That's why it's pretty easy to become anorexic, right? You can stop eating food because you can't afford stuff. And then because of the abuse also too. Uh but like I said, you don't get to choose to have a period. I don't get to choose to bleed. That's just, that's what happens to women. So I think I was getting $90 a fortnight and my rent was 50 a fortnight and for this room. And so, you know, things like no makeup back then, no way. That's major, major luxury. So no makeup. Uh, So I asked the lady that I worked for, would I be able to take some of the cotton wool that we use for when we're doing perms, because perms were so big in the 80s, -hmm. um, that they use the cotton wool to put around, you know, so it doesn't go into your eyes because the smell and the stench of it is so crazy. Oh, those fumes used to be next (laughs) level, right? Yeah, right. So then put the cotton wool around so that nothing leaked because it would, you, you know, you would, You'd never see ever again if it leaked into your eyes. Uh, And she said, yeah, yeah, sure. And so I used to take that cotton wool home and I would cut a a washer in half and I would put the cotton wool in between the washer and put it into my pants when I got my period. And, um, yeah, and then one day she said to me, "What what, what are you using it for? I was like, oh, I'll just, I'd like take my makeup off. And she's like, you don't wear makeup. I didn't have the carriage. I just said I'd just use it to, you know, do other things around the house, whatever. And she was like, well, what? what? She didn't mind giving it to me because, you know, I mean, back then it probably cost her a dollar, if, you know, for 400 metres of it. But, yeah. But I also used to use toilet paper as well. Thank you, Kim, for sharing your story. Um, it's more powerful than anyone will ever know. <laughs> yeah. Can you please share why you think somebody should put together a bag? I could give you a million, but I know you don't have that time frame to put this in a podcast. Uh, your charity launched 
my uh, ability to have no shame. It also, taking away shame actually gave me the drive to put my shoes back on, to dust myself off, wash my hair and do anything that I wanted to do safely and that somebody gave a shit. Not just me, but there was someone there. There was a, there was, there was a group of people led by this fierce warrior that actually heard me, felt me, and I knew was going to be there. It was so powerful. So if it's a bag, if it's, you know, uh, donating, if it's uh, volunteering, if it's um, putting your, having a golf day. I mean, I, I, like I said, I can think of a hundred things, but it has changed my life after 45 years and uh, what I've achieved in the last two years as a woman and a mother um, and my ability to talk and have a voice. Like I said earlier, as a three-year-old, I was conditioned to shut up and I had no voice for 45 years. Uh, that bag gave me my voice and you gave me my voice. So, um, yeah, it's just not the bag. It's a lot of things. So, so much supporting, more. Yeah, yeah. Than so just supporting Shedder Dignity is like amazing. Like it's life-changing. For me, it was life-changing. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome.